Hello, you beautiful sons of bitches, and welcome to another episode of Rant Time. First, let me just very quickly get out of the way. Where have I been? Well, I took a lot of time off to actually heal from injuries that were becoming excessive to the point where I couldn't even walk or roll anymore after training. I had a torn meniscus. I had a bunch of other stuff going on with my knee. I've hurt a disc in my upper neck, my lower back. I have torn tendons in both of my elbows. I, I got a lot of injuries, and I let them heal. Okay? Yeah, I got a little fat. You know, that's part of being bipolar and getting super depressed and not being able to handle your mental health when you stop training. And it's something I've been very open about throughout my entire career. Now, with that bullshit out of the way, okay, let's talk about the subject of the day. And the subject of today is basically sandbagging at the lower belts, okay? And I'm going to talk about winning the worlds at lower belts, okay, and what that means and the dichotomy between... Um, a blue belt world champion and a black belt or a black belt world champion, IBGF time requirements and a lot of stuff like that. Okay, so the topic is, are you really a world champion if you win the worlds at the lower belt? Okay, so let's start off with the super fucking simple stuff. Okay, the IBGF has time requirements. And for the majority of our sport, the IBGF has been basically the de facto governing body. Okay, we've we've had some breakout organizations like the ADCC, you know, we've got little tournament organizations here and there, some little invitationals here and there, but for the most part, the IBGGF has ran this fucking sport, okay, and they are the ones who have set the standard, and they're the ones who have the only world championships that actually fucking matter, okay, so all the high-level competitors have to go to those if they want to prove that they're anything worth a fuck, okay, and they make you stay at certain belts for certain times. You have to be a blue belt for two years before you can be a purple belt and compete. You have to be a purple belt for a year and a half. You have to be a brown belt for a year. And then you can get your black belt and you can fuck off and go through their stupid, disgustingly pay to win stripe system at black belt. Okay. So with that out of the way, all right, now let's talk about sandbaggers and sandbaggers are the ones winning the world championships or so Reddit says. Okay, it's no secret that I frequent the forums and there's a lot of stuff I agree with and a lot of stuff I don't agree with. Now, the thing I don't agree with is the concept of sandbaggers winning at blue and purple and brown belt. Okay, I'll start with the most egregious example of sandbagging I've ever seen in my entire life, which is Nikos Marigelli. The motherfucker was a brown belt and he basically grand slammed and then lost one match. I think he got fucking silver instead of gold in an open weight. So the piece of shit went all the way through again and did brown belt again. You only have to be a brown belt for one year. He was a brown belt for two years despite winning literally everything. So he won everything twice, but he's a fucking asshole. Okay, that was sandbagging. There is absolutely no other way to look at that without saying, okay, he's clearly sandbagging, but he won everything and he was only a brown belt for what, two years? Okay, so that's what sandbagging looked like. What it doesn't look like is someone being a blue belt for five years until they finally win the Worlds. Because guess what? Those people don't win. If they couldn't win in the first year, if they couldn't win in the second year, they're not going to win in the third or the fourth or the fifth year. Because they're not very good. Okay? Some people are just not meant to be high-level competitors. Some people are not putting in the work it would take for them to be high-level competitors. Okay? And no amount of time where they casually stay at their belt is going to change that, okay? And I'm, trust me, I'm gonna talk about that a lot in this video, okay? I'm gonna talk about the difference between like a casual competitor versus an actual competitor, okay? And it's gonna be very important. But I can't think of any examples of someone being a blue belt for fucking 10 years or whatever you motherfuckers say that they have been a blue belt for. And when you're making up these examples and these strawmans in your head, Okay, and then they finally won the world and they went around and said that they're a blue belt world champion. Maybe they're doing it at master's divisions, but everyone knows that master's digit, you know, the master division have their own special unique place in our heart, but they know that they're not doing the same thing that the adult competitors are. They're not fucking idiots. They are aware that winning at master's three is not the same at winning at adult. Okay, I've never heard a single masters competitors say that what they did is the same they don't look at it like that they're just happy to be there and you shouldn't take away from their accomplishments in the same way i don't think you should take away from someone winning the pans or the worlds at white blue purple brown or black okay with white belt being the only kind of exception and i'm also going to talk about that all right so 
with that out of the way, we got the stupid fucking IBGGF time requirements, okay? They should just be abolished, in my opinion. I kind of get why they're there and that they, uh, they, they're supposed to be standards for the sport, but then you look at guys like BJ Penn who got their black belt in a time span that is literally faster than the minimum IBGGF time requirements, okay? And he absolutely deserved his black belt, and he won a black belt. So th what, what are you really going to say to the guy if he's actually capable of doing it? Okay, and if obviously this is something I've had a lot of experience with in that I was fucked by the time requirements massively. Okay, when I was a uh, white belt, I won absolutely everything. And then we went to blue belt basically as fast as we could. And then I very much won everything, you know, like I didn't just win the worlds and the pans. And then I went and won the Nogi Worlds and the Nogi Pans. And then I won the Open at the Nogi Worlds and the Nogi Pans. So we messaged the IBGGF and we said, listen, he's won everything. Can we give him his purple belt? It's not really fucking right for him to keep competing against blue belts. And they said no. And they said if you give him his purple belt, he's going to get absolutely fucked. Okay. So I didn't get my purple belt in a year. I got it in two years. Okay. I had to go through the whole system again. Um, and then at that point, the only choice is do you just sit out and you do nothing for that time and lose all that competitive experience or do you just keep competing at blue belt? Okay. And some arguments could be made that maybe you should just sit out. But those are not arguments that are going to hold a lot of weight for serious competitors because at the end of the day, this is their actual career. You know, should a hobbyist be able to win the worlds? No. You know, it's it's always going to come down to like hyper competitive versus hyper competitive because it's the fucking world championships. Okay, so we, we, competitors look at it completely different. You know, there's a lot of cannon fodder in the divisions essentially that just gets blown out of the way until you run into the real competitor who's like you and trains all day every day. Okay, so I had to stay at Blue Belt for way too long, and that's back in the day there were people saying I was a sandbagger, even though we literally tried to give me my purple belt early, and they were just said, fuck no, and they had a personal grudge against me at the time, which I'm not going to very much go into, but it had to do with me beating up some Brazilian kids that were like the sons of the IBGF referees at the time, it's really super fucked up, and if anyone really wants, I can probably pull up some messages from like five, six, seven years ago, but I'm not really trying to focus on that, but the IBGGF time requirements are stupid. They should be abolished. They don't withhold the standard of the sport because someone who sucks after three years is probably going to suck after five years or seven years unless they massively update their training model. They may learn more, but they're not going to be able to apply that, especially against someone who's very competitive or very athletic. Okay, If you notice like your average black belt is getting a train ran on them by moderately competitive blue and purple belts, that's that's the honest answer why is they're just not training the same they're, it's almost like we're doing a different sport okay and like I said I can't really think of any good examples of someone that you know they sandbagged so long that they were able to win the blue purple and brown belt worlds okay they might win like the they might I can't think of an example of this but let's say someone sandbagged for five years at blue belt they did the fucking blue belt worlds every year for five years and they kept losing until the fifth year they finally won and then they went around bragging their blue belt world champion i don't even think that's happened okay but that's like the straw man that everyone has in their head when they're thinking of blue belt world champions what realistically happens is someone starts doing jiu-jitsu they get very into it so they start doing it full-time okay and full-time means like they're training multiple times a day very close to every single day and they're drilling and they're doing conditioning and they're stretching and they're watching footage and they're trying to get better at the sport actively instead of passively okay two years for that guy is going to be like 10 years for a casual that blue belt is going to absolutely run through everyone in the division that's not like him that's like a hyper competitor okay and then he's going to get to the finals he's going to have someone that's very similar to him in, in skill maybe or maybe he's just going to blow through the guy now is the best blue belt in the world at the time a purple belt now here's where we're gonna get uh feisty so no they're not okay if you go by like the normal standards of casuals okay that blue belt that just won the worlds trains full time he's trained full time for a couple years he's gonna fucking destroy your coach unless your coach is like a competitive black belt you know, like an athlete, because this is a sport that people forget. You know, it's like, fucking, you have to be physical. You have to have physical attributes to enable your technique. You have to have cardio to enable your technique, okay? That blue belt is going to absolutely, basically destroy most black belts. 
and I'm not just saying this, and I'm also not just bragging, but this is like how my early career was. You could take me as a blue belt when I was successful as a blue belt, put me in any, almost any gym in the world, okay? And I'm making obvious uh, exclusions. Like if you put me in AOJ, I'm not gonna fucking tap Hoffa Mendez when I'm a blue belt, no fucking way. Okay, but then you're, you're trying to compare different uh, classes, essentially. You're trying to compare competitive blue belt to competitive black belt. Whereas most people think in terms of competitive blue belt to casual black belt. I know a lot of black belts that could not win the blue belt worlds. They couldn't win it. They would lose to the best guy that's at blue belt at the time. Okay, And that guy that's at the best blue belt at the time might lose to the best purple belt at the time. He's not guaranteed to win, but it's just very likely he's going to find success later on in his career. Okay, Now you have the best purple belt in the world. He is going to fucking destroy your hobby is black belts. It won't even be a match. He's going to just embarrass them. And then they're going to either have their ego really bruised by a purple belt beating them up, which is something I've also ran into, or they're going to go the other way and be like, oh, that's the best purple belt in the world, period, which he's probably not. Let's be honest. It's probably going to be someone that's better than him at purple belt at that time. Okay. Unless you're literally dealing with the absolute best, which, you know, there's going to be a few of them. So it, that just has to do with the different ways that people manage their ego when they lose to a lower belt, which is kind of its own separate topic. But yeah, the best purple belt in the world at the time is going to fucking destroy your casual, casual black belt. And then if you go on, then you have the best brown belt at the world. And that guy, that is where you can start to say, okay, this guy's basically a black belt, okay? Because he's going to give the, be the, the best black belts in the world a decent run. He might lose, but he's not going to be helpless. He's not just going to get destroyed. He's not going to get fucking embarrassed on camera probably he's gonna he's gonna at least put up a fight before he loses okay and that's why you see those guys that win at brown belt they go on and they are successful at black belt they might not just immediately win the worlds but they are putting a fight up that, you know and you could have put them in there maybe half a year or a year earlier and they still would have done the same thing okay so kind of the point is that the belts don't fucking matter okay a lot of times it comes down to the competitor themselves and how much actual hours of doing jiu-jitsu they have how focused their training is, like how condensed their training is. If you spread out training over 10 years and it's light, it's not gonna mean the same as a guy that's condensed their training over three years. Because that guy over three years is making marked improvements because he is focusing his jiu-jitsu. He's focusing on jiu-jitsu and all the different tangential relationships that have to do with jiu-jitsu, like stretching and conditioning and reflexes and all that, okay? So, We've kind of talked about the difference between a competitor and a casual. You cannot genuinely compare a full-time competitor to a casual hobbyist of any belt. Okay, and of course I'm excluding white belts because, you know, most places make you go to blue belt to begin with if you have any prior grappling experience at all or MMA experience, and that's fair. Uh, I don't think anyone is actually arguing against that rule whatsoever. That seems completely fine to me. If you have, like, grappling MMA experience, you should probably be blue belt, blue belt, okay? So, now let's talk about, like, with all that in mind, does winning it blue, purple, and brown matter? Like, should they be given any credit for their accolades? And again, like I said, I'm a little biased, you know, like a lot of my career success, you know, like I, I won everything at every belt, essentially. You know, like I won the worlds at blue, purple, brown, uh, I won the pans at black, and it's just, I personally don't think that you should be trying to dis discredit and take away from the people that are winning at the lower belts. Okay, it's, it's a common sentiment that I see on Reddit and I see on Instagram and Facebook and it's people that just haven't spent any time actually thinking about what goes into winning at these different belts, okay? Again, like the guy winning at blue belt is probably the guy that is training their fucking ass off. He's training more than your hobbyist coach, for sure. Okay, and then of course the guy at purple belt, he's doing the exact same thing. He's just a little further along in his career, and the guy at brown belt is doing the exact same thing. And the guy at black belt, they they may be able to coast a little more at black belt because they have such a strong foundation from the prior work that they put in, but they're still putting in an immense amount of work. Okay, and the casual competitors are just not doing that. Like in in the mind of a hyper competitive person, you sign up for a division, you don't even like care it, you could have a hundred casual people in the division they're just non-factors okay they're not going to beat you they're not going to do anything to you they might make you a little bit tired if they're particularly tough but they're not going to they have no chance of winning how often do you see upsets from a guy that trains twice a week 
tapping a guy that trains seven times a week. It never happens. Connor DeAngelis does not fucking lose to people who are not full-time competitors. He loses to guys like me that are fucking, uh, you know, like we train our ass off at the equivalent level of him and maybe we're better that day. Maybe he beats us the next time we go with him. It's just like how it is. It's just like you look forward to the matches against the hyper-competitive people, okay? So with that in mind, you're having basically an equivalent semifinals and finals match every single time at blue, purple, brown, and black. And some people are ahead of the curve, but if they were not putting in such an immense amount of work, they would get absolutely destroyed by the other guy who is putting in that immense amount of work. Okay. So the winning of the low, like competing at the lower belts is very important. And it's important for you to develop the skill set that makes you a good competitor. And a, a lot of times you can see the difference between like a blue and a purple belt competitor the brown or, or a blue and a brown belt is a better example the brown belt competitor has been competing for a lot longer and he is better at competing i mean of course his jiu-jitsu is probably better he's had more time to really become comfortable with his game and enforce his game on an opponent okay and a lot of it does come down to that it comes down to being comfortable with your game and being able to enforce it even when the other guy's trying to enforce his whoever is more comfortable in the match is probably going to win with exceptions, but that's the general rule that I think is true, okay? So the blue belt hasn't had enough time to really beat the hyper-competitive brown belt. He can give him a match, but he's going to lose, okay? So you develop that skill at competing by competing, okay? If you start to devalue these lower belts, you're going to end up making the sport a lot weaker, okay? Because of how hyper-competitive the lower belts are, by the time these people have gone through the fucking crucible and got to black belt, they're they're very close to ready for black belt okay Be, if, like if you didn't put any emphasis on these lower belt titles they wouldn't be as good as they are when they get to black belt to be able to give you the entertainment and push the sport forward that everyone deserves because the sport should be pushed as much as it can it's a great sport okay so it's very important that you don't like like i get when a guy is uh you know He's won the Masters Worlds or something, and he puts that on his Instagram bio or whatever. But everyone knows that nobody takes that super seriously. There's a good chance he's not taking it super seriously, but it's just like the only titles he really has to put to his name, so he puts it up there. You know, it's like, it's cool. He thinks it's cool. You should probably think it's cool for him. Okay, you don't have to be an asshole about it. All right. Um, I'm getting a little... I don't know. I'm like, I'm like almost 18 minutes into this rant video. And like I said, there's a lot of different topics, but... Um, I just want to make sure everyone kind of understands why I'm doing this video. Like, there's there's a lot of threads that I see pop up all the time. And like I said, there was just one last night on Reddit that have to do with this subject. That people say, like, oh, if you're a white belt world champion, you're just sandbagging. And it's just not really true. Like, the people that you think are sandbagging to win, just they don't even win. You know, they can stay at blue belt for five years, but they're just not going to be able to beat the guy that trains his ass off at blue belt and is a hyper competitor. He's going to beat that guy no matter what. And if he lucks his way into a win one time, they get to put in their bio, I won the Blue Belt Worlds in 2014 one time. You know, like at the, And at the end of the day, still, it's like nobody's taking that super seriously or they're taking that in context. Like if, if a guy won every belt, at it, you know, every title at every belt all the way up until they were a brown belt and they didn't compete at black belt, does that mean the guy sucks? Fuck no, that guy's fucking awesome. Like he just, he won every belt that mattered up until he got the black belt. Then when you get the black belt, the jump in skill is so immense that you, you're not really expected to win. It's awesome if you do, but you're going against guys that have been at black belt, competing at black belt and winning a black belt for so long. You know, you really have to be a breakout star. And another thing to understand is that a lot of times it's not black belts pushing the sport forward. Black belts get very established in their ways. They become very engraved in the patterns of the techniques they use versus other techniques they're slow to adopt new metas they don't you know they basically become conservative in how they roll okay and you can see this reflect in other sports when people get to a very very high level they're usually the slowest to adopt new metas okay the purple and brown belts they just don't give a fuck they'll try new things and sometimes those new things are very effective you know like the people who popularized Baron Bolos and Maris De La Hiba and shit. They, you know, they did it at purple belt first. I mean, we heard of the Meows crushing everyone when they were purple belts and then when they were brown belts and when they finally got their black belts, then they got to crush everyone at black belt. But they were doing the new stuff first at the lower belts. And a lot of times, like I said, I watch the lower belts because they are more willing to take risks and they're more willing to try new things. And sometimes those new things do work out. And it's just the reason they're not more popular is people are slow to adopt. And you can be ahead of the curve if you adopt early stuff.
Okay, and that could be what gives you the competitive edge when you do go to black belt. Okay, and you see over time, like the black belts eventually will adopt some of the new techniques. But the only reason they're doing that is because it's so successful when the guys are purple belts and then brown belts. And those guys got good at doing the move sets when they were purple and brown belts. So that when they finally become black belts, they're comfortable enough with that new move set to do it at black belt. Okay, so... This is almost completely unrelated, but it's another thing that pisses me off. Is like when you sh when when you have this new move set that's being adopted at the lower belts, and then you have your old traditional coach who's just had twenty five years of ruling pressure. He's just a better grappler in general overall than the lower belt that's trying new stuff. And the lower belt's like, hey, coach, check this out. This is really cool. And the black belt's like, ah, oh, that wouldn't work. Do it to me. No shit, you can't do it to you. You're a fucking black belt who's been trained for twenty five years, whose pressure is incredible. You know, like I could listen, I could spend five hours showing you how to do the perfect knee slice, but you're not going to do it to me because I'm very fucking good at what I do. Okay. And that's the same thing. It's just like you, you can't disregard a skill set or a completely different way of approaching technique off the cuff because, yeah, your lower belts in your gym probably can't do it to you because you're just better than them and pressure matters. Okay. But if you give them fucking four years of working on that, and then when they get the black belt, they'll probably beat your ass with that technique, okay? So again, it's just kind of a little reminder to be open to new techniques and new metas and not just become stagnant, okay? So this video is way too fucking long. Um, yeah, this is like 21 minutes of me ranting about lower belts and metas and world championships and all that. You know, again, the takeaway is the lower belt championships are important. It, I don't think a blue belt world champion is in terms of impact on the sport as important as a black belt world champion obviously but the blue belt world champion is very likely to become a purple world cha world champion and the purple belt world champion is very likely to become a brown belt world champion and the brown belt world champion is very likely to make waves in black belt and they have a good chance of pushing the sport forward at that point you know they're going to shake things up maybe, maybe they don't but you can kind of see how this progresses right so IBGGF time requirements are fucking stupid. I hope they get rid of those completely. Uh, I personally was fucked by them. I know people that were fucked by them. And it's not really fair to call someone a sandbagger when they are literally stuck at a belt for the minimum time requirements. The people that are actually sandbagging generally don't win. You know, like the people that are sandbagging that stay at like the lower belts for multiple, multiple, multiple years are just not good enough to win. And if they lock their way into a win at purple belt, they're not going to win at brown belts. It's not going to happen. They're just going to completely disappear. And at that point, do you really care? Okay. And then we have, you know, like actual cases of sandbagging, like Marigali, I think, you know, you stay at brown belt for two years when you won literally every single tournament. That's what I would look up and say is sandbagging. Okay, like if you're exceeding the minimum time requirements while also being as successful as you can be, yeah, that's sandbagging. And I'm not saying anything about Marigelli personally, you know, the black belt, he'd probably kick my ass. He's fucking incredible. But that is an example of what sandbagging should actually look like to people who care about the competitive scene. Okay, and with that said, I'm going to end this video. I'm going to let Bird edit it up. We're going to post it up. Uh, if you don't like it, go fuck yourself. You know, I just like making these because... It's enjoyable for me, and I like to be able to push the conversation forward. So, have a good day, everyone. Except for the people who don't like this. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Have a great time.